Oh, fun fact. I used to work in engineering for most of my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. another fun fact. That is a fun fact. Civil 3D CAD kind of environment. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah good. <laughs> And now I do this. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is a lot of connections between art and engineering, are, even yeah. though people don't mm-hmm. seem to make them <laughs> in terms of an obvious way. It's so funny so. because um, these these uh, incredibly brilliant engineers that are my friends, they're, they're such creative thinkers. It's because yeah. of that creativity. Like they've got all the math base. They've got all the stuff that they need to do to get the job done. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's that stepping back and being able to find a creative solution to a problem that I've just always mesmerized by. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That should probably that's be That's the, the beauty. <laughs> that's the beauty of engineering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just book smart. It, there's so much more to it. Yeah, it's not no, just exactly. good at math. To be, to be a great engineer, you're right. Yeah. It, it takes those two yeah. attributes. Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And I'm Mary Wells. And so privileged to be the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. We've got big news. Do we ever? We have a brand new website. And so many amazing things to check out on it. Bondpark.com. What can we find there? You can listen to our episodes right on the site. You can check out the Bond Park community blog. You can find out how you can partner with us. Oh, and the shopping. We have so much fun merchandise. I'm going to buy myself the I'm the Marshall Ward tote. Me too. <laughs> Bondpark.com. Check us out. Aren't you Dr. Mary Wells, though? Well, we, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to know that. It's confusing for them. Like, it, they're going to come and see me for, you know, they got a broken leg or something. So. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. All um, right. Uh, Kitchener City Councilor Sarah Marsh told mm-hmm. us a story on our podcast. Which one? The one that just came out. It's, oh, the no, story, no, I mean, which story? Um, that somebody came and said, you're a counselor, right? Said, oh, yeah, yes, that's true. Telling her like a, a real yeah. problem. Yeah. 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 She was like, no, no, I can refer you to someone. <laughs> and I can refer you to someone. That's right. That's but right. But it's so. language. Language is so important, right? Yeah. yeah. Language is important. Oh, it is. Okay. Mary Wells, thank you. Sorry, I was like sighing. That yeah. didn't sound good. <clears throat> Mary Wells, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so pleased to be here. We are incredibly excited to talk to you. We've been geeking out even before we got started. Um, I first want to kind of go back to our old model of how we used to start this podcast and emulate this feeling of meeting up in Bond Park, which is where Marshall and I met. So I'm going to ask, how do you two know each other? Right. So uh, Mary and I were both parents at the Kidavid Bilingual School at the same time. Uh, Mary has three kids and I have two. And our youngest daughters came up together in the same grade. And so we would um, see each other in school hallways and go to our, take our kids' birthday parties and various social events and Christmas parties. And as I got to know Mary, um, I became really fascinated with uh, her career and the work she does, and specifically um, a book that I think came out about seven years ago called Women of Impact. And I think it showcases, is it maybe 18 women? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. co-authored it. And I just love this book. I thought it was so well put together and so intriguing. Well, and that was really the beginning of... So after that came, Mary would have introduced my family to Go Eng Girl, yes. right? And, um, and I understood the, uh, the work you were doing that I really didn't know much about, about looking at uh, gender gaps and barriers that I wasn't familiar with. And I realize now that it had such a big influence on my oldest, Mason, who's now at Consulate College in computer engineering. Oh, that's great. And I feel so grateful to have met you at that time. Because it really got, that's, and, and Sarah and I look at a lot of things with our podcast. We did an episode on Technovation and, uh, you know, we met uh, the Google STEM program manager, uh, Sandy Curry at Google. And uh, Pete so Gray, geologist. Yep, Pete Gray. And, and rock drummer, which is funny. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I feel like this is a really neat episode because I'm kind of going back to the first person who really got me, got me thinking this way. Wow. Um, you want, can we talk about that, that book for, first off, sure, Women sure. of Impact? Yeah. yeah, no, no, for sure. And thank you so much, Marshall, for those incredibly kind world, words. And I, I'm so grateful that I did have a positive impact on you and your daughter, who's now in computer engineering. That's awesome. But really, the book came about because of two loves of mine. I, I love engineering, but I, when I was in high school, I also loved history. And, you know, at some point in time, you do have to choose what your path will be for either practical reasons or whatever. And so I did pursue engineering, but my love of history and stories 
and the stories about people really has always stayed with me. And so I did uh, later in my career, once I'd met all these amazing women, and I just felt their stories weren't being told as much as some of the stories about the men who had accomplished amazing things. And I knew so many women that had done so many things. And I just felt it was time to tell some of their stories. So I partnered with an oral historian. And we decided that we would interview these women that in my field in materials engineering had just had such a big impact. And we hadn't heard their stories. And I thought by telling these stories and the diversity of their lives would help uh, let other young people, young women in particular, perhaps see themselves as engineers in the future. Because often we do have very stereotypical views about who engineers are, what they do, what they look like. And it's hard to get your mind out of that. And I thought, I thought this might, might be one way to disrupt what they were thinking. And so I, it was just the most wonderful, wonderful project. And one of the women we profiled, Ursula Franklin, who was actually a seminal person in my life, because when I was uh, a student, I never really had a female professor. I started to work in the steel industry. And I was actually questioning, do I belong in engineering? There's no women around me. Uh, many of the men are so obsessed with engineering with their whole lives. I didn't see them having really good work-life balance. And, you know, I was driving to work one day and I heard Ursula Franklin on the CBC radio being interviewed. And so she was a professor at U of T in materials engineering, my field. And I was just awestruck by her. And I started, she had wonderful books about the role of technology in society and started reading more and more of them. And one of my dreams was to meet her one day. And so part of this project was my chance to meet Ursula Franklin. And I got a chance to meet her, to hear in her own words her story. And it was just so wonderful and joyful, I would say. So, And she just died a few years ago. So I feel it was maybe one of the last interviews she did. So, And part of this project, too, was to take these stories and put them into the library archives at the University of Ottawa as kind of a historical record of women in engineering uh, so that in the future people can go back and listen to what it was like to be a woman in engineering at this time in our world's history and things. So that piece right there is so important. I feel emotional just think just listening to you, Mary. Um, documenting, archiving and preserving the stories of what great women have done. Absolutely. Is often overlooked. Yeah. Um, and it is so important that women are the ones telling that story to other women about women. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm not sure if everybody gets that, but um, it has to come from us. It yeah. has to come from a place of us without somebody else's voice on it. And um, and it is that storytelling that will perpetuate a healthier vision of what we're capable of and uh, what's been overlooked. No, no, that, that's a great point. And I, you know, I'm reflecting more now about how the entry of women into engineering has forever changed the trajectory of the engineering profession and the kinds of things we focus on, the kinds of questions we ask, the approaches we take, the perspectives we bring. And it's just, it's just so, so important. So I hadn't really thought about women being involved telling stories, but you're right. That, that's a great point in terms of women being the ones who ask the questions and think about, uh, think about the answers and ask more questions about it. So... There was recently a 33-year-old woman named Jessica Wade who made more than a thousand Wikipedia bios for um, unknown female scientists. Yeah. Right? Just of her own volition. That's amazing. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to go in here and make these because nobody else has done Yeah. No, I think work. that's... I saw that actually. Yeah. What a great initiative to, again, get the stories out. Yeah. And I could watch more Netflix or I could sit and do this. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. Yes. In terms of the impact you will have on the world. Yeah. And just, again, the stories we tell and the people we see who represent different facets of our lives. And so the more diversity we can show in that, the more diversity we will attract into those professions mm -hmm. in the future. The storytelling. The storytelling is so important. So, And I just want to touch on Go Ench Girl because we mm -hmm. just ran it last weekend and I was speaking to the parents and the girls. We had about 100 girls come to the University of Waterloo and Go Ench Girl is a really, really special program because it was, at the time it started... I don't know, probably like 15, 16 years ago now. And it was a, a woman, a good friend of mine, Valerie Davidson, who was the NSERC chair for women in science and engineering at the University of Guelph, who really, again, took a very different approach to outreach and how we might be able to attract more women. And, you know, often universities are competitive with each other, especially as we attract students in. But she said, well, no, let's work together and have collective impact in terms of a program where we can all participate together and do it as one group. And that was the beginning of Go Eng Girl. It was a program she thought of. And so it started in Ontario uh, as kind of a coalition amongst all the Ontario universities to do it. And I had the privilege of taking over as the chair of the Ontario Network of Women in Engineering. 
and I think that was maybe when um, your daughter, Marshall, came to the program, but it's, it's a program that's well-designed because it's not only for girls in grades 7 to 9, 7 to 10, uh, a critical time because, you know, that's when you've got to make important choices in this, the, this, the uh, courses you're going to take in high school, which can lead you to closing doors in terms of opportunities at university or not, but also their parents. And so I'm so pleased to hear how it affected Marshall as a parent because it gave him the knowledge, the skills, the desire, I guess, to support and to know the know-how to how to support his daughter in making a, a, an unusual decision to study computer engineering at Conestoga. So I, I, I think that's really, really powerful. So thank you, Marshall, for sharing that with me. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yeah, great seven to ten. That that really is it. Um, I, I imagine as we move forward, um, perhaps even sooner, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure, for sure. I think the the problem is like right now across Canada, we grade 10 in Ontario anyway is the last academic science program you need to take after that it becomes your choice and these are critical decisions and so parents need to know how to support their kids in making those decisions but I also want to tell the kids the the young adults that if you make certain decisions it will close off doors and I don't think you want to do that and I think that's partially a reflection of maybe our engineering system being too rigid in terms of the pathways of people that we allow in and we need to look at that but also just getting the word out there so so the, right now the biggest bottleneck is physics more girls don't take physics in grade 11 or 12 and we start to see big gender gaps in physics that's that's the that's the science we need to really work on so right now across Ontario it's you know it's been about 34 percent girls in grade 12 physics for the last decade so you know we haven't really moved that number much and so the best and grade 12 physics is a requirement to come into engineering across Canada, pretty much. So if all those young people were equally interested and motivated to study engineering, the best we could hope to do is about 34% women. And that's just not acceptable. We've got to get to 50% and represent our Canadian population. So, And is, is that, when it comes to physics, is that because, again, what women have seen for all these years, that most physicists are men that you at least read about and see on television and, you know. Can yeah. I interject with something? Because yeah. I remember my oldest daughter telling me in math class, um, there's a whole long history with her in math. I don't know if I want to spill all of her beans, but um, something happened around grade five where yeah. somebody told her she wasn't good at math. And she was always good at math and always a creative thinker when it comes to math. And it wasn't really a memorizer, a little bit more yeah, like yeah. me where I do like a visualization like those primary school like the the primary grades 10 blocks makes so much sense to me <laughs> you know even if I'm putting two numbers together I start at the top and I shave numbers that I don't need off anymore just it's a weird process right she was always good at it and something happened around the fifth grade where a boy told her no you're not mm. and then that's been a struggle since then there's just something that that clicked something that happened and then in high school um I said just ask more questions like you you've got this just ask more questions from your teacher it's like well if I raise my hand this boy this boy yeah, this boy yeah. laugh yeah. that I don't already know it, right? And I don't think they know the answer either. No, they don't. There's some of that as well. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I think you're right. It's around grade four, grade five, where girls' self-perception of how good they are at math and some of the sciences does start to change, despite the fact that their marks may be higher yeah. than the, the, the boys. So it, they, it's they very were. strange. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think you're right. It's It's the mental models we develop based on the media images we see, the world around us. And you know, one of the things I showed at the Go Eng Girl on Saturday was in, I think it was 2018, I did a Google search for engineer and I looked at all the images that came up and it was like all men in hard hats. That's what the world looked like. So mm -hmm. I actually mentioned to the Google people here and they're like, oh, that's not good. We'll change that, mm -hmm. which was frightening to me in itself that they could. So I did it again last weekend to Google search for engineer in 2022 and it had changed a lot. Yeah. So now there's about 40% women represented in those images. And still a lot of hard hats, but not as many. But it's still 40%, which is still more representative it's of more representative. what is actually happening. So things are changing, but it takes time. And I think that's, and, and just getting back to what you said, Marshall, about physics. I mean, I think you're right. You know, Big Bang Theory is one example of, um, they do have some fabulous, you know, female physicists in it too. But there's studies that have shown that, um, the the higher the brilliance that you perceive to need in fields, the lower and lower the number of women that go in. And this isn't just in the you know natural and applied sciences. This is in the arts too. So in in the natural and applied science, the the ability p belief that's at the highest levels are for things like physics, computer science, engineering, and those are the professions that we see the lowest participation of women. In the arts, it's philosophy. 
That's, you know, you, you, need, you have to be really, really smart to be good at philosophy. And again, those are the fields we see the lowest participation of women. So it, it comes down to how brilliant do you need to be and women not believing they're brilliant enough and men also believing that. So it's kind of self-reinforcing. This is so important that you're talking about this because also there's a creative thinking factor that I'm thinking about now, which is, and I haven't talked about this on our show since middle of the pandemic when we were recording offsite at the bilingual school, but um, we are taught as women from a young age that we need to act appropriately, not be boisterous, typically, right? I'm talking about across the board here. Appear smart, but not too smart. Right. Right. Uh, and keep our shit together, basically. <laughs> keep ourselves under control at all times. Where boys are typically taught to play, explore, run, yeah. break things, figure things out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is such a dangerous model for this type of creative thinking and intake of information to be interested in physics or science absolutely. or math. Absolutely. And it's maddening. It's absolutely maddening. So you hear these cutesy little comments like, oh, she's the girls are so much more mature than the boys at this age. I don't know what that is. We did that. Yeah, That's yeah. what that is. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, we're not going to raise girls that are going into somebody's house and breaking all their stuff. Marshall says to me often, like, I'm so glad I didn't have boys because can I say this? <laughs> yeah, they, you can. they just they run into your house and break all your things. I don't understand why they or do I, this. Or I just, it seems like everything's a sword fight. <laughs> yeah, which is fun. I mean, I was just reading a meme online this morning that was when you see a, a empty Christmas wrapper, uh, Christmas paper. Sorry, let me try to say a that tube, again. Yeah. A cri- yeah, when you see an empty Christmas paper wrapping paper <laughs> tube, is it a lightsaber or do you bonk someone on the head? And I immediately said, like, my comment was both, 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 both. You do both. <laughs> That's what's fun about it. Playing, right? Playing that spirit of adventure. Yeah. No, definitely. We have to instill that spirit of adventure and allow our girls to be able to explore in an unfettered way, I guess, in some yeah. sense. So, And we definitely see it like when we, you know, in our first year engineering program, when we, you know, have a kind of a unstructured lab and we just put parts in the middle, the boys all run in to, to start to work on it and the girls hang back. Mm-hmm. And that's not good for them because they don't get the hands-on skills. They don't get to decide, you know, the creative direction that the project may take and stuff. And when we are fantastic at taking things apart and putting them back together. Exactly. Again, because we exactly. are typically from this model, without unfettered play observers exactly mm-hmm. exactly and there's and there's an important role to be played to play also as an observer mm-hmm. and boys should do it a little bit more too because there's so many things <laughs> yes. you learn by observing. and men <laughs> and you know whoever else <laughs> yes please observe <laughs> yeah i live with three women if something in the house needs fixing it's not me <laughs> <No>. <laughs> sylvia help <laughs> i hear that a lot of those stories <laughs> for sure <laughs> oh. We're going to take a moment to hear from this episode's sponsors, some of our favorite businesses in town. Bond Park is supported by Artline Salon. Artline is not like any salon you've ever seen. To truly get what Artline is about, you have to experience the experience. So whether you're looking for a subtle change or ready to debut a dazzling new look, Artline will work with you to create a masterpiece. Artline is located in Belmont Village in Kitchener. You can call 519-585-0230 or visit them online at artlinesalon.com. They're also on Instagram. This holiday season, Artline Salon is running a campaign to raise food and funds for the Food Bank of Waterloo Region. If you stop by their salon, they've got all the boxes there. You can donate uh, funds, like we said, or you can donate some items from their high needs list. Canned fruit, vegetables, meat, fish, dry beans and pasta, hot and cold cereal, individually packed snacks, jams, spreads, peanut butter and rice. So again, check that out at Artline Salon. The food and funds campaign at Artline will run from now until January 31st, 2023. Please support by donating one or more of those items that we mentioned or stop by and donate some funds. We are also supported by Benjamin Tree Farm, located at 770 Benjamin Road in Waterloo. Christmas trees bring joy into your home during the holiday season. You can harvest your own tree from 40 acres with thousands to choose from or a beautiful selection of pre-cut trees. My family absolutely loves St. Nick's Picks, their gift shop. It's open throughout the Christmas season, has everything, it has ornaments, small gifts, all made by over 70 local artisans. These items range from woodworking to knitting, handmade soaps, scented candles, and bath salts and chocolates. And Benjamin Tree Farm has truly become one of my family's magical Christmas traditions. We are supported by Clean and Tidy Cleaning Services. Clean and Tidy is all about making life a little bit easier and a little less stressful for their clients. Serving Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, and surrounding areas, Clean and Tidy offers both residential and commercial cleaning services using safe, natural, and green 
products. In addition to cleaning and dusting, the Clean and Tidy crew will also fulfill requests like making beds, washing and folding laundry, and vacuuming furniture. Visit cleanandtidykw.com and book a free consultation. We are supported by Herb and Good Family Funeral Home. They've been big supporters of Bond Park since the beginning of our podcast. As the area's longest serving family funeral home, Herb and Good has helped people in Waterloo Region through difficult times over the past 77 years and have the experience and flexibility to exceed your expectations. The caring staff, family ownership, personal guidance facilities, and reasonable prices have become the hallmark of their service. They are steeped in tradition. Urban Good Family Funeral Home is located at 171 King Street South in Waterloo, or visit herbgood.com. Bond Park is supported by Heartbeat Hot Sauce. Ooh, I love Heartbeat Hot Sauce. All of Heartbeat sauces are made with maximum flavor and balance in mind. They've got a range of flavors, including red habanero, jalapeno, pineapple habanero, blueberry habanero, piri piri, and a scorching scorpion pepper sauce. Visit them at heartbeathotsauce.com and follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Treat your tongue to some exciting new flavors that will raise your heartbeat. Bond Park is supported by Winnie's Gluten-Free Kitchen in Belmont Village. I love Winnie's. I lived the gluten-free life and man, was I ever happy when I found this place. They've got loads of pre-made frozen meals, pizza dough, which is one of my favorites, and fresh baguette and breads right in the store. But for me, I get stuck at the dessert counter. I'm not really a sugary sweets person, but I never leave without their lemon squares, which I make Marshall eat as well. And he's like, I don't even care that they're gluten-free, right? That's true. (laughs) And the butter tarts, cinnamon buns, eclairs, cannoli, so much more. Just absolutely the best gluten-free baking I have ever had. Um, Check out all their scrumptious offerings at winniesglutenfree.com and follow them on social media. We are supported by Wordsworth Books, located in the vibrant heart of Uptown Waterloo. Wordsworth was our very first sponsor on Bond Park Podcast in January of 2020, and we are so grateful for that. It's also our favorite bookstore in the Waterloo region. Yes, thank you, Wordsworth Books. Co-owners Mandy Browse and David Worsley are happy to special order any title you are looking for and pride themselves on being able to obtain the hard to find and the out of print. Support a local gem like Wordsworth Books, which is so much more than just a great bookstore. It is a one of a kind gathering space and a vital part of the region's cultural community. Find Wordsworth Books online at wordsworthbooks.com or visit them at 96 King Street South in Uptown Waterloo. And now back to our show. We, uh, we were talking before we uh, started recording here, Mary, that um, this episode will be released on December 7th. The yeah. day prior is the uh, anniversary of the Montreal Massacre. Mm-hmm. Do you remember where you were at that time? Or, or maybe if not so much where you were at that time when you heard that news, but rather in the years to follow how you kind of processed and thought about that? Yeah, no, no. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those events that's etched in your mind forever. And I was, I just graduated from McGill. So I'd been uh, in Montreal just a few years earlier. And I was a young engineer at Stelco, and I remember exactly what I was doing when I heard it on the radio. And you were just in total disbelief. I just remember thinking, well, why the women? Like, that was my first, I don't understand. Why? Like, I didn't get it at first. I know, I know, I know. And, and to be honest, at that time, I never really thought of myself as a woman engineer. I thought mm-hmm. of myself as an engineer. Yeah. And it was like, why would they target women? It was so shocking to hear about it. And, you know, just the fact, the kind of hatred and destruction of people that didn't even consider themselves feminists, <laughs> that, yeah. that just wanted to be engineers because they loved math and science and stuff. It was just such a waste of human potential and things. So, And uh, yeah, so it, it's it's a difficult day every year for me and for all, all engineers. You know, men and women were equally affected by that. And, you know, some men went on to commit suicide that had been in the room mm-hmm. because they they wondered what they could have done more, but they couldn't have done anything more, but they, they couldn't live with the guilt of what had happened and things. So, so it, it's such a tragic day, but I try and focus on the positive of what women have achieved. And, you know, I'm about their age. I'm about the age that they would have been today. These young, these four, well, 12 of the women were engineers or engineering students. And so what would they have achieved if they had been allowed the chance to fulfill their career aspirations about, you know, be, becoming an engineer and contributing in a positive way to society. Um, the message is always like, you're here working in this field still. Like, mm-hmm. this cannot be for nothing. 
Right. We right, are right, here right. and yeah. that did not stop any of us. Yeah. So no, keep exactly. moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. And that, that kind of persistence and things. So, yeah. but I, I do think we've, you know, that was really the first time I think in the history where everybody paused, not just in Canada, but around the world. It was such a shocking mm-hmm. event. It was the largest mass murder in Can- Canadian For, 14 history. 14 women. 14 mm-hmm. women. Yeah. And it really forced the profession, the universities to really think about, well, why aren't more women coming in? I don't think they really thought about it very much before that. And so it did lead to some very positive things coming in terms of a national report around the status of women in engineering and things. And, you know, many uh, outreach programs forming, uh, women in engineering programs forming in many of the universities, uh, etc. And so some very thoughtful, meaningful action came out of that. Uh, which I think is very positive and, and still were the roots of where we're at today, where we, we, we've done very well in terms of advancing uh, women in our engineering programs and move, women going into the profession and things. So so that's very, very positive. And last year, uh, you know, I have some wonderful, wonderful colleagues who are other female engineering deans across the country. We kind of just looked at some of the the first wave of engineering female deans in engineering and profiled them and just a story again just to talk about you know they were they were really the first wave of people coming through I guess I'm part of the second wave of the next generation of women engineering deans and I I just feel so supported at the engineering deans table both by my female and male colleagues and stuff so everybody's kind of really aligned as to the importance of diversity in engineering the importance of getting more women into engineering and the you know this is not a social justice issue it's really it's well documented that the more diverse perspectives that are at the table the more creative the solution will be the better the solution will be as you consider more and more perspectives in designing this product that humans are going to be using. That's just building good community. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's building good community. <laughs> yeah. You're right. So <laughs> when you speak of that creativity, I guess that comes down to really new and fun things you can, you can make now. I, and before yeah. we started recording, I heard you mention um, like a repair kind of thing. Oh, yes, yes, oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. So <laughs> this came up because when Mary walked in, she saw this uh, Sunoco gas pump. That it, the, anyone who's been in Studio K, as we call it yep. here, recording because it's my kitchen, <laughs> <laughs> has seen. Um, I've got this refurbished uh, antique gas pump in the corner here, um, and the motors out of it. If you open it up, uh, I've got actually piano rolls for my player piano inside stacked in there. A lot of old songs, um, and the uh, crank still works. So if you turn it, goes ding, like it still works. Um, and when you saw that, you brought up this yes, lab that you're creating. Yes, Tell us yeah. all about that. So it's it's not my initiative. It's uh, It was actually a staff member, Murray Zink, who was in our co-op office, who was really passionate about sustainability and got a small grant at the university around sustainability. So he's created this kind of repair cafe, I would say. And it, it's really wonderful. And I'm re- very supportive. So I've given him space and some time and some tools. But he runs it, it was partially to address a sustainability issue on campus where people are just throwing things out, but we can't do that. And so we can, they can bring them to this place now and refurbish them. And part of it then is to give our engineering students a chance to see how things work and take things apart and put things together and the joy of repairing something so it is functioning again. And so I would love to see it become more broad in terms of a community initiative around a larger uh, repair cafe. Um, and I think another name might, for it may be what I repair or something. And then even all our lab equipment, when something's not working, could we bring it down there and get the students to take a look at it and repair it and things. So I, I, th- I think it's great from a sustainability perspective. I think it's great from a high impact learning uh, opportunity for our students and a community building activity, both within our university, but also more broadly in our larger community in Waterloo region. I, I'm not a materials engineer. <laughs> this is not my field. But this practical part is so important, learning how materials yeah. behave. Um, yeah. Again, not an engineer, but I've made a lot of stuff and fixed a lot of stuff in my life and watched my father and uncles and, and all these wonderful thinkers make and fix things. Um, so I have this sort of innate knowledge, like that glue with that piece of wood yeah, and that piece know, of metal. You have the practical knowledge. That's not going to hold together. <laughs> That screw with that picture in that wall? No, (laughs) it's not going to happen, right? Um, But you don't know until you do it. You You don't don't know know until until you try. That's right. And that, and really, you know, the engineering education is a balance between the practice and the theory. And it's always that balance between practice and theory. And this is really what makes Waterloo's engineering program so unique is we do intentionally interlace the practice and the theory through a cooperative education program, which is one of the largest in the world. So, and that's why our engineers are graduating are some of the in most in demand talent in the world because they have that good balance of practice and theory. Those marks that you need to get into those programs now, I hear from my kids are yeah. really, really high. 
Yeah, they are now. Especially, especially with COVID. Dramatic. Especially with yeah. COVID. So, yeah. um, I, uh, I I'm glad to hear that uh, you feel so so supported in your role. Um, what, was there always support there? I guess I mean. Back in high school, there must have been somebody telling you, you can do this, Mary. You know what I mean? Like there's, a, there's yeah. opportunities that lie ahead for you. I definitely remember uh, when I, I grew up in Quebec. So I went through the uh, high school to grade 11, then stage up. And I remember, I think I was in grade 10. I was in physics. I'd gotten my first boyfriend and my marks were starting to tank because I'd lost my focus and my physics Note teacher. to all <laughs> youngsters, <laughs> this is the trap. It's nice to be in love, but be careful. Be careful, yes, yes. Don't lose your focus. Yeah. That'll affect your future. My physics teacher pulled me aside and said, what's going on? You know, you, like, you're, you're really kissing. good. You're really good at physics. What, don't let, you know, someone distract you away from your future goals. And it really... You know, th- th- I really appreciated that he'd taken me aside to say that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. I've got to focus on my future too. After so. the initial embarrassment, most likely. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, that's right. Yeah. So. It's a di- very different experience from my uh, high school guidance counselor. Hi, Mr. Rooney, um, who told me very late in the game. The kids have so many tools now when they don't have guidance at home or... Um, or, you know, a plan necessarily. Like the, the way that you can select your high school courses and look towards the future and plan for university is very easy online now compared to when Yeah, that's true. Be. That's true. Um, and also, I was very distracted in high school. Um, but I remember my guidance counselor saying, Marshall's heard this so many times, uh, art and music aren't a job. And you haven't taken any of the right courses to go to university. And I was like, Kuh. like, oh, just no. crushed. I was yeah. like, what? and I, I, I didn't really recover from it. So it's my own fault that I didn't find a way out of that. But I just decided everything that I have been working for was a waste of time up until Well, it's that too point. bad he couldn't find another pathway for you. Like, it just seems like it, you're still he so young. He was a gym teacher with yeah. the, you know, like it, it wasn't <laughs> okay. a great system necessarily. Yeah, I hear you. You know, it wasn't, and I, and I didn't put in that work to figure it out for myself. And I had a lot of other things going on. But um, had I had a different mm-hmm. lift or shift or focus, or if I had yeah. taken an opportunity to listen to somebody else's advice, I know Les Flyzik actually gave me a lot of advice that I didn't take. Um, he's a past guest on our show. Uh, it would have been a different story. It would have been a different story. Because yeah, I ended up in art anyway. Yeah. Well, and that <laughs> was where your passion is clearly. So, and yeah. your aptitude too. Yeah. So that's awesome. But I, I do want to just touch on the importance of role models because mm-hmm. we've, you know, we've gathered a lot of data from the Ministry of Education over high school courses, what people are taking, but then also married it with the census data. And we see clearly that in communities where we have adults with a STEM degree or a higher proportion, more girls are taking physics. And in communities where that isn't there, that's not happening. So really the challenge I think about is how can we in those communities where we don't have those adult STEM role models create surrogate STEM role models? And so we are looking at this STEM is for everyone club and we partnered with the Toronto District School Board it, going into the communities where there's not a lot of adult STEM role models and seeing if the girls that are in physics can become those surrogate STEM role models. And and they're not even surrogates, they're real role models. And just create these clubs for girls in grade nine uh, and 10 and talk about the joy of STEM, the joy of physics, and see if it can make a substantive difference in those girls that are enrolling in grade 12 physics. So, What's uh, what's the role of a dean look like for you? Um, once you achieve being a dean are you no longer in the classroom um what are you doing? no i'm still in the classroom we are. so i mean not all deans do teach but i i felt it's important just to keep you know in touch with the students and so i actually am going to be teaching in the winter i teach a it was a course it was kind of a passion project i guess it's about becoming an inclusive engineering leader and innovator i taught it for the first time last year so and it was i was thinking oh all these women are going to sign up it was all men that signed up <laughs> and it was the most wonderful conversation with them amazing it was so open and honest and they want to do they want to learn how to be better leaders in the future how to support women how to be allies for them and stuff so it's really wonderful so I'm doing the second offering for it uh, this winter and we'll see I hope some women sign up this time we'll see it'll change call to women to sign up for this <laughs> yes please do so if you're in fourth year <laughs> um do you have some global sense of where things are at with um engineering and g- gender gaps I, I have a neighbor who's from uh, from Egypt who says uh not so much a gender gap there. Is, yeah, as no, it, it's true. There are differences yeah. around the world. In Western Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, North America, we still see a big gender gap. In developing countries, not so much. And I think it's partially because in a developing country, you can really feel and appreciate the value of engineering and engineering accomplishments in your country to helping uplift the people in that country. And so inherently, you understand that value. And so we see 
many, many women wanting to go into engineering there because of the significant impact they can have on the human population. In the Western world, you get up in the morning, you have clean water, you drive your car, you don't really see all the engineering marvels around you. You kind of take them for granted. And so you don't fully appreciate or understand what life might be like without clean water, without electricity, without, you know, transportation, things like that. And so I, I, it's kind of like, you know, as a kid, you go visit your doctor, your dentist, you know what these people do, your teacher. Engineers, you don't see. They're kind of all around you, but you don't see them. And so you, I say that you see their brain prints everywhere mm-hmm. if you look around. Uh, but Everywhere. You, everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. It's everything it's that when is you see someone made. slip on a sidewalk I'm like oh I see that okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I see what that's going on there <laughs> so so you definitely see that I, I think that's my view of maybe why we see some of those differences and I think it's also how you value um you know how you value what's going on and you know you look, look at Iran Iran is a country where we have significant uh wonderful women that are studying engineering there and many of our graduate students come from there so um, so, so women there, there's much closer gender parity in a country like that. So, and they really highly value science and engineering as a, as a culture, as a country, basically. I don't know if it's the same thing in Canada. Like, who are our biggest celebrities? The sports people, some of the big artists and things. And I'm not saying that's bad, but... But you, there's a disparity. It doesn't a disparity, make sense. Yeah. Who is our famous engineer? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. don't have Who one. is Iron Needles? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yes, right. yes. So. And so another story, Elsie McGill was the very first woman to graduate, I think in 1927 from U of T in electrical engineering. She went on to lead in the, in the war, the production of the hurricanes, the aircraft up in Ontario. They started writing comic books about her and comic strips, and she was called the Queen of the Hurricanes. And they would have little comic things about, you know, her doing different things. And she also suffered from polio. So she ended up being a person with disabilities and had to walk with a cane and stuff. And just was the most amazing person that persevered, love engineering, had always wanted to be a pilot, but that dream was robbed because of her disability, but still went on to do amazing things. But my point is, she was a celebrity back then. People knew who Elsie McGill was back then. We don't know who our most famous engineers are today. So I think Canada has a, a unique moment in time right now um, around the engineering we do and the engineers we we educate, because right now when you look at tech, you know, there's not a lot of trust in big tech in the States or China, maybe, but the, the, there is a lot of trust in Canadians and Canadian brands and things. So I do think we have a unique opportunity to continue to emphasize and educate engineers that can imbue trust and ethics into the technology we design and understand the importance of doing that so that the technology we develop here is trusted around the world and can help accelerate Canadian companies in tech and things like that. Companies like Shopify and things like this. These are well-trusted companies that put people over profits instead of, you know, monetizing things that, at, to the detriment of people's well-being and health and things. And eventually everyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mary, do you ever get confused with Mary Wells, the definitive voice of 1960s Motown? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I must say, when I introduce myself to people and they say, I think I've heard your name. I said, I'm not the famous Mary Wells. <laughs> she was one of the Supremes and she sang my guy. And so I remember distinctly, I was over in England and I woke up and the, to the news that Mary Wells had died and, you know, the, the outpouring of tr- grief and things for the loss of a wonderful artist. Not and stuff, funny, so. but I see the humor here when you're... <laughs> and so anybody that I... So anybody says, I know Mary Wells, that name is so familiar. I said, I know the kind of music you like to listen to. <laughs> Mary, uh, you've raised a family here. And uh, when I think about Waterloo Region, you know, you have the University of Waterloo, which is just so highly revered right? Um, on so many levels. And then we have, you're surrounded by these think tanks and just all sorts of other amazing things and growth happening in Waterloo Region. Um, where do you th- where do you think we're going from here? Is, is it all interconnected in, in some way? Or are, are some of these places working independently? Or is, is there something happening where there's, we, we can't even see the totality of it all, the way what the work being done at the Primbury Institute is connected to the Institute for Quantum mm-hmm, Computing, which mm-hmm. is uh, connected yeah. to University of Waterloo. Um, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do think we are all interconnected. I think it's such a wonderful community. And, you know, we don't just have the University of Waterloo. We have Wilfrid Laurie University. We have Conestoga College. So we're really fortunate to have, you know, all of these wonderful universities and think tanks. We've got CG. We've got the Perimeter Institute. These are all interconnected. And I do think the University of Waterloo, we can do a better job in terms of making sure those connections that we're taking advantage of where we're at in this community and really elevating and uplifting this community to be 
you know, just a, a wonderful place. I, I came from Vancouver, you know, I, you know, I just tell everybody, it's such a wonderful place to raise your children here. And, and you know, maybe it's the, some of the Mennonite roots and things in terms of this sense of community um, and things like that. And, and just being, being able to do wonderful things here, whether it be cultural events through Center in the Square with our symphony, you know, I went to see some of the, the classical music at the Perimeter Institute, just so many opportunities in this community, no matter what you're interested in. And, you know, when I went to the KW Symphony and they were doing kind of fusions between math and symphonies, I was like, what a great opportunity to bring these two fields together, because ultimately we are all connected and our, we, we've arbitrarily separated out our knowledge into these different disciplines, but it is all connected to each other. And the more we can create those connections, the better it is for everyone, I think, so... Bond Park is made possible with the support of the Kitchener Public Library and the Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation. Our show is produced by Sarah Geidlinger and Marshall Ward with audio engineering by Sarah Geidlinger. Bond Park's original music is by Alan Lung. Hey, are you still with us? We want to tell you about a fun project that we have. (laughs) Are you ready? Yeah. We have another podcast called An Unscripted Spectacle, Wrestling with Wrestling. Here's Colin Hunter of Kayfabe News to tell you all about it. Welcome to an unscripted spectacle, wrestling with wrestling. I'm Colin Hunter from Kayfabe News. Marshall is utterly obsessed with professional wrestling. Sarah is utterly perplexed by professional wrestling. On each episode of an unscripted spectacle, Marshall and Sarah talk with a different guest from the world of wrestling. Promoters, referees, journalists, and current and past stars of the Squared Circle to talk deeply about the strange magic of professional wrestling that has enchanted Marshall his whole life. Can they turn Sarah into a fellow connoisseur of professional wrestling? She'll need some convincing. I find out who Jimmy Corderas is. Who the heck are you? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> For those who don't know, um, I spent uh, the better part of over two decades uh, working in WWF slash WWE, uh, mostly as a referee inside the ring. I have the honor of meeting the magnificent Lefisto. I heard that you were described as the first lady of hardcore. I've just <laughs> recently found out what hardcore is. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Madman Pondo. <laughs> thanks to Madman Pondo. <laughs> when I've learned that I was going to be inducted. It was like, it is now my time to tell the story of women's wrestling. Because so many times I've heard, oh, this is the first time this happens in women's wrestling history. And I'm like, no. I learned all about the storytelling and writing process from Tom Cassiello. Yeah, I was in uh, soap operas for 14 years. I was in Young and the Restless last. That was from 2009 to 2011. And so I thought, I'll go in for the interview. I'll be honest with them. If I blow it, I blow it of the end of the world. And I was there for six years and I rose up the ranks to managing lead writer. And it was the most insane time period of my entire life. I got a new skincare regime from RJ City. Checking out your hair and I wish that mine looked like yours. <laughs> you have beautiful locks. <laughs> Thank you. The secret, this isn't a plug, it feels like an endorsement, is what? aloe vera. <laughs> I have it here. I put it on my skin. I put it in my hair. <gasps> I use the, the gel. I put a couple drops of peppermint in. I have a plant right there on my Good, fridge. cut yeah. it open, squeeze it out, and put it, honestly, wherever you want. It's good for you. I find out that Colt Cabana is just famous enough that he can still buy groceries, and Tyson Kidd tells me all about the people's elbow. Who knew? Tyson comes to a complete stop, then brings <laughs> his leg leg over the guy like he's gonna do a leg drop, but he the leg like keeps circling <laughs> past the guy, and then he drops an elbow on the guy. Oh, and the elbow it's- represents like all the people of the fans? That, that, like that's like he's start- been voted, you know, he's going to drop this elbow. Well, like, well he, like he started calling himself the people's champion and then that move be just became the people's elbow. <laughs> and then and there's then, also, as you know, there's the people's strudel. What? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's the people's eyebrow. There's a lot of the people. Got a lot of people. <laughs> so check out an unscripted spectacle, Wrestling with Wrestling, available anywhere you get your podcasts.